Thank you. All right, um, so I'd like to call this special rules committee meeting to order. We're scheduled today from 12.10 to 1.10 p.m. Um, let's go ahead and start with the roll call, please. Felix Rivera. Present. John Weddleton. Here. Jamie Allard. Here. Christopher Constant. Here. Forrest Dunbar. Mr. Dunbar is excused. Uh, Crystal Kennedy. Here. Suzanne LaFrance. Here. Cameron Perez Verdia. Here. Pete Peterson. Present. Meg Zalatel asked to be excused. You have a quorum? Great. Thanks, Barbara. Uh, as usual, if folks want to get in the queue, please put yourself in the chat or text me if you can't access the chat. Also, as usual, for rules committee meetings or special rules committee meetings, please feel free to be informal. First names are okay. Okay, so for the presentation today, uh, I am going to go through a, a few slides. Uh, members should have received them earlier today, and they were posted online earlier today as well. Um, so uh, apologies for not get, getting them uh, done sooner. <laughs> Uh, things have been changing on a daily basis in, in DC, so I wanted to ref wanted the presentation to reflect that. Um, okay, so I'm, I'm going to actually, uh, Barbara, I'm going to go ahead and share on my screen, and um, so you don't have to worry about doing it on yours. Okay, so folks should be able to see. So what I will do, because um, as I am sharing, I won't be able to see the chat, is I will just go through all of these slides and then and after that, we can have a discussion. OK, so today, uh, the only topic on our uh, agenda is to review the draft public outreach plan for the additional COVID-19 funds. Um, so I wanted to go over a few things. First is what is already in place. Um, so as folks know, we went through a, a very rigorous process the first time that we did this. and. Um, we had a lot of um, things already in place that we can utilize for this second round. So first is framework and priorities. So for folks who don't know, I'm going to actually stop sharing and uh, share that document for folks who maybe don't remember. So just give me two seconds. Okay, so for folks who don't remember, um, we spent a lot of time um, coming up with this uh, document, the Anchorage Assembly COVID-19 Response Framework to include priorities, timeline, guiding principles. And then we also had the uh, a definition of some of the priorities. So um, this is that framework that I mentioned in the slide. So I put the slide back on. Um, we, uh, of course, have a variety of programs which uh, were built up and set up uh, thanks to great effort by the administration and a lot of community partners. Um, so those programs are already in place. We have a uh, COVID-19 uh, website by the assembly that's already in place. Um, you know, of note, of note, the website didn't exactly meet its full potential, but I think it's, a, it's uh, something that's in place and we can use. That website was the primary way for folks to uh, provide a feedback mechanism. There was a um, portal that folks could provide their feedback and it got sent to all assembly members. So I think members remember seeing that. And then we also have survey results that were done by Meg. Um, she um, put out a survey to various um, individuals, businesses to try to get a sense of um, some of their feedback on the various programs that were done. So. We already have uh, quite a bit in place already. What are we still waiting for? So um, we are rating on reports on some of the prior programs. So how did we spend the money? Did the programs work? And what are, what are some of the demographic data that we have for some of the various programs? Um, I'm hopeful that the administration will have some of these um, things ready for us in, in short order. Then uh, just last night, the US Senate introduced a vari variation of the COVID-19 stimulus package that was passed by the US House. So um, going through that whole process, not sure exactly how long it'll take to get through the Senate, then back to the House, then to the president's desk. I'm hoping it's not too long, 
but I imagine there's still some some weeks of process left to go. And then um, I'm sure there will be guidance that comes out. I'm not exactly sure how different that guidance will be from the previous guidance. Um, so uh, that'll be something that I'm sure we will dig into. And then, uh, you know, the last step is for Treasury to deposit the money into our bank account. Unlike the last time around, um, at least in the from the version of the bill in the House that I remember seeing, um, the bill had a provision where uh, cities of a certain size, I believe it's 200,000 or more, could go directly to Treasury to get the dollars that were allocated in the bill. Um, so uh, last time around, folks may remember, we had to wait for the state to do their process, and then the state gave us the money. This time around, I think we'll be able to go straight to Treasury to get the money. Um, so what can we do before passage in Congress? Um, so, so these are some of the initial ideas that I put forward, uh, things that we can do now. Uh, and I know other members have, have mentioned some of these as well. So we can receive, review, and analyze some of the reports on the prior programs, which I mentioned in the prior slide. We can meet with stakeholders on some of the major programs that are very likely to be rec replicated. So small business relief, rental and mortgage relief. Quick side note on that. Um, I The bill that's currently in the Senate has, I think, $20 billion. I may be wrong on that number. It might be more um, set aside for rental and mortgage relief um, that goes directly to state and local governments. So, um, and that's aside from the pot of money that's just for state and local government, so two different pots of money. Um, so that'll be a, a policy decision that we have to make if from the local and state government pot of money, if we want to put additional rental and mortgage relief. Um, but that's a de decision that we will make as a body, nonprofit relief. So some of the programs uh, that, again, likely to be rec replicated, we can begin meeting with stakeholders. Um, I think it makes sense for us to review the framework and priorities just to do sort of a gut check to make sure that that is where we still um, are landing as a body. And then hold our first meeting to determine allocations. I think it, it might be good for us to get a, a head start on it before um, the bill goes to the president's desk and, and gets signed. Um, because as others have mentioned, uh, there is, uh, I think, a, a desire for us to move faster with this round of money. And so I think having that first initial meeting will help us move faster. So timeline after passage, um, I put these in as weeks because I have no clue when Congress is actually going to pass the bill. So um, that is why it's framed as such. So uh, the first thing I think we should do after passage is meet to sort of understand the federal guidance, to understand if it's changed, if it's pretty much the same guidance as before, or what that looks like. I think fairly quickly, much like what happened for the first round of stimulus, we can prep an initial ordinance to allocate a small portion of the funds. I just put in a random number, 20, 25%. If members may remember, for the first round of stimulus, um, the administration brought forward a couple of proposals while we were, we were in the middle of our process, uh, but they were proposals that I think we all agreed on that needed to get done. Small business relief, rental and uh, mortgage relief were part of those proposals. Um, so, um, you know, I'm thinking we could probably replicate that same thing here so that we can get some of the dollars out quicker. Um, then uh, the next step is uh, the second and, and hopefully final. So, you know, I'm hoping that uh, we can do two of those full day, half day meetings like we did last time to to get us to a final determination on allocations. Begin the public outreach, uh, do an initial ordinance, uh, approve that initial ordinance at a regular or special assembly meeting, that 20, 25% of the funds. Then um, from there, we would prep the ordinance for introduction at a regular assembly meeting, and then hopefully, um, you know, within four to five weeks of of passage in Congress and signature by the president and the money in our bank, uh, we have approved the ordinance at a regular or special assembly meeting. So, um, you know, from my perspective, compared to the first time around, this is uh, somewhat ambitious. Um, I think this cuts the time in half or more compared to the first time around. Um, I think that was it. Yeah. So um, at this point, 
um, be interested in having any discussion. Uh, and really what would be helpful for me is on both of these slides, so what can we do before passage in Congress if there's anything else that folks thinks we could do? And then, you know, what I will do is starting next week, you'll see count, um, meetings added to the calendar for us to start checking some of these boxes off. And then if folks have any thoughts on here, if there's anything different that they think we could do. So uh, any thoughts on these two slides would be helpful. I'm going to stop sharing. If you want those slides back up, I'll ask Barbara to put those slides up um, so that way so I can see the ch chat. OK, um, so I'm going to go ahead and start our discussion on this. Uh, I'll start with you, Mr. Constant. Thank you very much. Uh, two things. March 14th is the projected date for passage or before, although, as you suggested, things are in the air, so it could change. But um, we should be looking closely at that date as the date Congress finalizes this bill. And that's because that's the date that the emergency unemployment benefits expire. And um, anyhow, um, the only thing that I would add to your list of programs that I'd like to consider continuing outside of anything new we might come up with is the community infrastructure programs that we funded. There were four or five of them um, that are having the same problems this year that they did last year. And so I want to make sure they're on the list. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Kennedy. Uh, thank you. Um, I guess even after Mr. Constance's comment, I think um, I'd like to have just a conversation in general about what we think went well and what didn't, what we should have done, shouldn't do again, uh, need to do again. I think we all have opinions about how the money was actually spent the first time around. And um, I think we should probably have a better uh, consensus about um, really what we what we do do with some of that other money and particularly uh, in how some of the current funding is going to be continued. So, um, you know, I think there are things, what I don't want to see happen again is us get into that position where we actually end up having to explain to the Treasury Department what we're doing with our funding. And um, so I think uh, it would behoove us to just have a better, more general conversation about the specific things that we we know or we agree that we all agree we should be spending the funds on and then some of the things that maybe we don't want to go down a certain road with a certain amount of, or a certain allocation of funding um, this time around. So thanks, Felix. Great. Thanks, Crystal. Um, any other discussion? Yeah, Felix, I don't see it. For some reason, I don't see the chat room in my, I don't know if there's something wrong with mine, but I can't get access to chat. So I may just have to jump to jump in at times. Um, yeah, go ahead. So uh, just a couple of thoughts. Yeah, I, I without, I think we should be primarily forward facing, but I do think there may be some benefit of looking back and um, analyzing kind of what went well and what, what didn't, but I, I don't want to spend a lot of time do, doing that. I, I do want to say that, that, um, that um that we um that generally speaking i i think the categories that we have make sense um and that um that i like this idea of not thinking of funding programs as as much funding areas of need and um and so that's a, i guess a comment that i would make you know, I just I want to just sort of um, check that I, you know, you know, there was nothing, nothing happened in terms of my understanding of of legally spending anything wrong. I think that we we followed all of the guidelines and did all the things we were supposed to do. There was, but I do think it's valuable looking back in terms of 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 how we how we made our choices and how we communicated with with, with the public and all of that. So anyway, I would just say that I think that there's some value in that, uh, but I would like to stay pr primarily forward fa facing in terms of next steps. Um, and yeah, and I, I have a few more thoughts, but but I'm, I'm going to hold them until I hear it from, from others. Thanks. Thanks, Cameron. Uh, Alex, did you want to respond to Cameron or did you want in the queue? 
Um, I was just going to clarify, thank you, Felix, what, what Cameron said to reiterate that um, while there may have been early on some uh, discussion about how the money uh, could be spent, uh, how the money actually was spent was completely in line with guidelines that we received directly from the Treasury. And Felix, as you stated, and Mr. Bockenstead is working directly with our congressional delegation on a lot of this, it's not expected that those rules would change. So uh, the same criteria would be applicable. So there's no mystery on what we can and can't spend money on. I think the, the added benefit that may work through this bill is that money may come directly to the municipality for our use. Um, and then the final thing I would just say for planning purposes is that um, even though there will be money coming directly to the municipality, it's going to be split in the same way that uh, the recent um, rent and utility relief was split in that we got roughly 40% of the 80 million that is available for Anchorage directly, i.e. 35 million, and the balance went to the state. So I believe I would expect that the same thing would happen with the funds that we are receiving in the future. We'll get roughly 40% of the money straight to us, but the 60% balance, which would be applicable to Anchorage residents, most likely will have to go through the state. And I'll stop there. Thanks. Uh, John? Well, thanks. Um, yeah, I, I guess just some throw some things in the pot. I don't really have some perfect answers, but it would be a, a really helpful to get a complete report of what we spent and who got what, and, and also when um, money um, made it out to the public, and then what entity was used to distribute that money. You know, was it Visit Anchorage, ADC, Cook on Housing, and so on. Um, and, and then kind of go through that. And I think some of our things that we did may not be necessary for what would essentially be, you know, expect recovery funds. How do we pick up more of the pieces as opposed to survival funds? How do we use this to help people survive? Um, so things like daycare may not need it anymore because people are starting to go back to work. Daycare has figured it out and they're moving on. But, you know, what would be really nice is to have a tourism season again. So maybe really ramp up advertising Anchorage, you know, we have great stats with COVID, we're almost, we're all vaccinated or whatever, you know, whatever our, you know, attributes would be in addition to the normal ones. Um, so that I think the focus on that would be, you know, getting the economy, getting these businesses back again. And and then to administration, I don't know if Alex can speak to it or whoever else might be there, but, you know, it was, has been frustrating, I'm sure across the board, how slow it was getting money out there, you know, like the tourism money you know, finding someone to distribute it, getting their system set up and so on. And, and I just wonder if Alex or whoever can, can say, are those systems now in place so that this next round will go really fast or are there weak links? Like people did it, they did it, groups, organizations did it, but did it poorly, won't do it again or whatever. You know, what, what are we facing on um, I, that practical side? I know Mr. Schutte is is on the phone, so I'll let Chris answer those questions. Uh, thank Chris you. Shooting, go I, ahead. I don't know if I was called on by the chair or by Alex, but through the chair, uh, Senator Member Weddleton, you're absolutely correct. Building the building the machine, building the ATM machine was hard, and it took time, and we did it. And so, to the extent that the you know the assembly and the public um, looks to distribute funds through similar programs, you, you mentioned tourism uh, as one uh, desperately needed uh, relief area. Um, we do have those those uh, machines in place and distribution of funds will go faster. Um, I would point to the hospitality round two payments, the uh, additional tranches of rental and mortgage assistance as examples of how monies appropriated by the assembly for a program that was already established can move much quicker once the machine is built. So uh, short answer is yes, they will go faster. Thank you. Well, good. Good work. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, John. Uh, Chris Constant. Uh, thank you. Uh, 
you know, Alex, I think that there is going to be a difference in some of the criteria, as I understand it. They're actually going to be looser than the previous bill. We'll have more flexibility in how we appropriate these funds. And so um, while the programs we haven't established, I think we should keep, we may find better ways of doing it as we roll through this conversation and see the final bill. Thanks, Chris. Crystal? Thanks. Um, yeah, and I don't know how you might answer this, but one thing that's been troubling me since, uh, well, I'm down in in Colorado with my in-laws right now, helping them out, and an interesting thing happened in the state of Colorado uh, over the issue of fraudulent unemployment payments. And I know we're not dealing with that uh, as far as what we get for post but thinking about how rampant apparently some of the fraudulent claims for need have kind of arisen. Um, I know I've heard anecdotally some things from people in our community about how their nephew or their cousin or whatever is drawing unemployment and they're getting, uh, but they're working and they're still getting uh, uh, help for the rental relief and mortgage relief. And, you know, so it kind of goes back to Cameron's comment about focusing on the needs. And I'm just wondering how can we focus on the needs, but at the same time really hope that it goes to the people that really do need it and aren't fraudulently applying for, um, for some of these funds. I think the same question applies to some of the businesses. We know that some of the businesses just truly couldn't make it and just went out of business. And, and that's a fact. I mean, especially when I think about so many of the vendors that rely on the Christmas bazaars or the weekend markets or, you know, something like Bear Paw and the, and the State Fair. But um, how we haven't really had any way of trying to assess the uh, real need for some of these businesses. And I'm not suggesting that that we go to that extent because I can't imagine what you would have to go through to to actually try to figure out how to make these grants more merit based. But I guess I'd, I'd at least like to have a little bit of a conversation about that. Um, you know, are there ways that we can protect these funds to make sure that they go to people that really need them? Are there ways that we can protect these funds uh, to try to sustain businesses in such a way that they, that they can make it? Um, because we know that some businesses are just, they're just going to be gone. And as sad as that is, I don't know that we can save some of them. But anyway, I'm just kind of concerned about the fraud aspect of some of this and if there's been any conversation about how we can minimize that. Thanks. Thanks. So I have three folks uh, lined up to respond to that. So I'll start with Chris Schutte, then Alex, then Jason. Uh, thank you. Through the chair, Assemblymember Kennedy. Um, that's, a, that's a great observation, a great point. Um, each of the uh, grant programs that you've highlighted, whether we're talking rent and mortgage assistance, uh, small business assistance, et cetera, all of them do have a, a verification process of some kind built in to the application itself, as well as a, a component of merit. In other words, um, demonstration of the impact of the pandemic and emergency orders, et cetera, to the, to the recipient. Um, the, the depth or the degree of that due diligence has varied across the programs, but it is in place for each of them. Um, you know, for example, uh, the small business program that, that you highlighted, it had a requirement to demonstrate the financial impact or loss on revenues year over year. Um, it's a little bit of a time consuming process to work with business owners on those due diligence and verification and need based uh, verification uh, protocols. But uh, like you highlighted at the end of the day, it helps ensure that the individuals who are applying for relief funds are individuals who have a demonstrated or, or demonstrable uh, need for those relief funds. Uh, we're always aware of the delicate balance between uh, efficiency or efficacy of getting the funds out, but also the need to verify and validate. Uh, and I think by and large, we've we've found uh, processes across the board that can achieve both. Um, but it's top of mind and will remain that way as we look at uh, future funding opportunities. Uh, thank you. Thanks, Alex. 
Uh, I was going, only going to add that, like Crystal, um, I too have seen the reports relative to fraud with the welfare programs. And as Mr. Shuby said, um, there was trying to be a balance between um, gathering data and being quick to distribute the money. And in that instance, uh, the government uh, leaned toward being quick to distribute the money. Uh, as Ms. Kennedy uh, rightly said, um, we had nothing to do with the, the welfare program. And, and as Mr. Schutte has said, um, we did as much due diligence as, as we could to try and balance out um, timeliness of response versus accuracy. And then I'll stop there. Thanks, Alex. Jason? Yeah, I was I was just going to throw out there that um, <clears throat> there are many individuals that are likely taking advantage of multiple different programs. And uh, just for example, the new um, uh, uh, rental and utility assistance program that we are partnering with AHFC and CIHA on. Um, it is very likely that individuals receiving unemployment insurance um, that qualify there are very likely potentially to qualify for the rental and utility assistance. So I, I just wanted to I just wanted to flag that just because um, you know people might be qualifying for multiple aspects of the support that is out there doesn't actually mean that there is fraud. It just means that they are meeting the criteria that are set up um, to provide as much assistance as possible to those that um, uh, need it the most. Thanks. Anything else, Crystal? No, you know, that that's really helpful and I appreciate, you know, the conversation. And, and like I said, I'm, I'm pretty sure that what goes on within the municipality is pretty different than what goes on at the national level. But um, I guess just as a personal comment, I will say that uh, my father in law was just notified that he had received over seven thousand dollars worth of unemployment insurance and he has been retired for over thirty five years. So, like I said, there are some interesting fraudulent things going on. But um, but again, I was concerned that um, people were probably taking advantage of those uh, of that criteria that can be met and and really, you know, coming out definitely ahead of the game. Um, and so my only concern would be, are we leaving people out entirely because others are taking advantage of the system? And and there's probably no way to really control that, like um, you know, like Jason was saying, if they meet the criteria and the eligibility for any of those grants, then then that's kind of the end of the of the of the thought there. Um, but again, I, I just want to make sure that there's not something that we can do to make sure that we could stretch out funds even farther if it would be helpful to get it to people rather than making sure that some get a whole lot more than others and others are left without. But um, you know, again, it, it does go to that that question of merit, and I appreciate the things that are in place. I just hope we'll maybe, um, you know, listen uh, in terms of how people are seeing where the system might be being taken advantage of, and if we can find ways to just identify those potential issues and then maybe address them. But I don't know. I don't know how widespread it is. I just hear things here or there. Um, but again, like Jason said, it goes back to basically being able to meet the, the criteria and eligibility requirements. So I think we're just kind of where we're at with how we're doing things. So um, it sounds like we'll just probably keep the same processes. So thanks. Thanks, Crystal. John? Oh, thanks. Um, Question for, I guess, Judy or whoever, Jason. You know, we had the um, ADC's, or I guess, Economic Resiliency Task Force, I think was managed by them. But did they come out with a recovery plan that we could refer to? I'll go ahead and take that one. Through the chair, Assembly Member Weddleton. Um, they, it's interesting that you bring that up. The timing is good. The Economic Resiliency Task Force um, did initiate a forward-looking economic recovery effort. Um, I'm probably going to butcher the name, but I believe it was called the Roadmap to a Vital and Safe Anchorage. 
Um, it was a planning effort facilitated um, by the Chamber, AEDC, Visit Anchorage, Downtown Partnership, and others. Um, they had uh, you know, a series of public sessions with anywhere from 70 to 120 participants, all of which were focused on the question of how do we set Anchorage, uh, the Anchorage economy up to survive in the near term, adapt in the midterm, and thrive in the long term. Um, their final uh, product, if you will, or recommendations are forthcoming. I don't have the exact date or timing in front of me, but it was uh, stood up to coincide with this opportunity of additional federal relief funding coming down the pike. Um, of course, it's not solely focused on uh, relief funding, though. It also contains other initiatives, uh, et cetera, that can benefit uh, rebound in the Anchorage economy. Thank you. Good, thanks. I think they have a week before we need it. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, Chris Constant. Thank you. Yeah, they're actually pretty close to being ready to share with us their conclusions. I didn't actually participate in their goings on because I didn't want to be conflicted. And uh, I understand it's been very robust and thoughtful in its approach. And it's citywide, mini wide, not just downtown. It does have a downtown plank. So you'll be hearing from me on that. And, um, you know, on to the, the kind of or back to the conversation about kind of the interesting challenge of being flexible and un less restrictive enough that we can quickly get the funding out versus uh, being more restrictive with requirements so that we make sure the money only goes where it's best suited. It's a real challenge because you have heard complaints about how long it's taken to get funding out. And that's basically with pretty limited uh, mandatory restrictions or qualification terms. And so, um, you know, and for me, one of the most frustrating things that I found after the small business funding went out is I'm aware of a bar that instead of paying for staffing or keeping the doors and lights on, they bought a virtual golf machine for about $15,000. And, um, you know, to them, that was the best way they could spend the money that we put out there for them. And to me, that was pretty shocking. And I don't want that to happen. I want people to be covering the expenses to keep the doors and boosting the economy. But I hew to the um, approach that we previously utilized, which was let's be as efficient as we can getting the money out. So any conversation about restrictions should probably be based on the particular targeted funding areas so that they're not overbroad so that they cut up people who might otherwise should be eligible out, but it's not under under broad so that, you know, it's just a free for all and people are able to do things that are pretty absurd. Thanks, Chris. Crystal. Thanks, Felix. Uh, you know, it occurred to me that in a comment that I made, I probably should clarify and I want to let you know that uh, there is no fraud going on with my father-in-law claiming any unemployment. I'm just saying that he found out that obviously his identity was stolen and somebody did put in a claim in his name. So um, anyway, that's just part of kind of the reason why I have a lot of concern about this, just in terms of trying to really track a lot of this stuff and, and make sure that we know where stuff is going, where it's supposed to be going and, and that kind of thing. So anyway, but I just wanted to clarify that it wasn't my father-in-law who made a false unemployment claim after being retired for over 35 years. So thanks. <laughs> thanks for that clarification, Crystal. Any other discussion? Okay, so um, uh, thanks for all the feedback. I, I will look at it incorporating um, that feedback as I finalize the, the plan. And you all should see uh, meetings um, being scheduled, uh, likely starting next week for us to do um, a lot of the things in the slide, what can we do before passage in Congress? And then, um, you know, hopefully uh, as soon as Congress finishes the deliberation and um, the president signs the bill, uh, we'll be able to get uh, going on some of the rest of the measures that we have outlined. So yeah, probably look for a busy next month, month and a half or so. 
Um, okay, so with that, we're going to go ahead and move on to audience participation. Um, I see, Mr. Haberman, that you are ready, so go ahead. Um, set my timer. My name is Eugene Carl Haberman. Um, first of all, I want – you can hear me, okay, right? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. can okay. Um, um, first of all, um, the funds that the – that you are uh, going to receive in the near future from the feds, you need to also remind yourself, this is only happening because we're dealing with COVID. This is not normal funds that you would normally receive in other years. We're dealing with an emergency, although the state has difficulty, our governor, to indicate that there's an emergency, but the feds are, 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 uh, uh, addressing funds, and um, when you do receive those funds, you need to realize that this is not a normal situation, and you need to be more responsible in how those funds come come to you and handled. Um, I can't help but notice that the remark was, and it reminds you as a new an example of the second time in a row that your funds that you receive are going to be bypassed by the state. It's going to go directly to the municipality because of the size of your population versus the Matsu Borough, which is the second largest populated area, um, doesn't have that advantage that you do. I have a problem with that scenario. I don't have question that it goes directly to you, but when you see uh, other communities that have to uh, have that another party in between, that's not really fair to them in the state. That's one point. Second is, I do not believe, and I'm not comfortable with how the monies have been managed, not just in Anchorage, but in the Valley and around the state. Um, it raises concern, and should, ra and I'm sure there are many people are concerned, but their voice is not being heard on this thing, and it's the same people out there that um, are involved with the monies, both in the public and 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 the government. And the public is not really being connected appropriately and heard about it. Now, before you proceed even, you need to address how you've been spending the monies in the past before you even have that public hearing. And not the examples of these uh, Anchorage Convention, the Visit Bureau, Chamber of Commerce. The fact is you as a body need to call a public meeting and call and allow public to address you at, on this issue and allow for – and only this issue – so you can hear from the public what has happened and their experiences in previous efforts for your distribution of those monies. To say that it's okay now, it's not okay now. And before you receive those funds and you use those funds, I'm telling you, before you even have that public hearing, you need to set the public hearing and examine what you've done so far. Thank you. My time's up. Uh, thank you, Mr. Haberman. Um, I don't see any other members of the public, but I'll just do a call out just in case. Would any other members of the public like to participate? All right, not seeing anyone, then I will go ahead and adjourn this meeting. And uh, thanks everyone for your participation. Have a good weekend. Thank you. You too.